Good evening and welcome to Delegate Bag Now's uh, virtual town hall discussing expanding of veterans resources. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, please do keep yourself muted uh, during the discussion unless you are asking a question uh, so that we can make sure to hear our guest speakers. Uh, also, if you would like to switch off your video, you're more than welcome, and that way it will help the, uh, the stream stay, uh, stay excellent. Uh, on top of that thing, if you would like to uh, ask a question, uh, you're more than welcome. Please just type question in the chat and, uh, and then the question itself, and then we will be able to field those. And if you are watching on our YouTube channel, uh, please, uh, you can also send us uh, uh, any questions that you have to uh, our web address uh, via email, which is heatherbagnall for delegate at gmail.com. Uh, other than that, it is my pleasure, of course, to welcome our fabulous delegate, Delegate Heather Bagnall. Thank you so much for joining us today for the fourth of our 2022 legislative session, virtual town hall series. I'm Heather Bagnall, your delegate in District 33. I first wanted to thank you all once again for your continued commitment to our community as we navigate this this latest COVID surge. We're not quite out of the woods with COVID and the transition from pandemic to endemic continues to bring with it some new challenges, but we are grateful that our county has acted so quickly to make available the vaccine for our youngest constituents. As I frequently say, COVID is very real and still present and it requires everyone to ensure we can keep our community safe, our businesses open, our children in our school buildings and our live arts alive. Tonight, we are going to talk about some of the strides we have made in expanding services for our veterans and veteran families, where we continue to see need and, and how we can partner our state and local agencies to ensure coordination of services and continuity of care. I am honored tonight to be joined by members of our veteran and advocate community who have been working on policies for Purple Ribbon families, mental health and peer services, suicide prevention, uh, veteran services, tax policy, and even a dedicated grant to address traumatic brain injury. Dan Toodle is a retired US Navy officer, Naval Aviator and pilot. He was also a member of the Anne Arundel County Veterans Affairs Commission and has been a leading advocate on a number of veterans issues, including the creation of the Commission for a Maryland Women Veterans Memorial. Dawn Guile is a lawyer a nonprofit leader, a military spouse um, and a candidate for Senate in District 33. Sergeant Curtis Gunny Jones is a retired Marine who works tirelessly for better mental health, peer-to-peer -peer and suicide prevention services and greater coordination between county, state and federal services. Um, we had uh, hopes that, that Congressman Anthony Brown from the Veterans Affairs Commission would be able to join us uh, this evening, but he is actually in a long, um, he's in a long voting session, so, um, so, um, he's, he's not going to be able to, um, to join us on, on this call this evening, but he did send his, his regards and reaffirmed his commitment to uh, not just to, to our, our congressional district, but also to uh, the needs of our veterans and our veteran families. Um, if you haven't yet done so, please make sure to subscribe to my social media. I primarily use Facebook and Twitter for immediate information and so as not to clog up your inboxes, but I do send updates on events and issues within the community. I will warn you, I've been accused of many things, but brevity is not one and it's something I continue to work on. Thank you all for being here and for your help and your advocacy throughout our session. And I especially want to thank uh, our congressional partners who have, who have always worked side by side with, with our office and throughout the pandemic. Um, uh, to, to be respectful of your time, uh, I'm going to, to try and keep this to, a, to an hour. Um, I know we're all a little bit zoomed out, so I appreciate you being here. Um, and I will attempt to answer all questions, but if we can't get to your questions on the call, we will circle back with you to make sure you have, have the answers that you need. I also wanted to recognize on this call, John Church, who is here from the Veterans Affairs Commission, and Emmett Roberts, who's here from the Maryland Veterans Chamber of Commerce. If you do have a question and have not submitted it in advance, please feel free to put your question in the chat. Um, I also want to thank Caroline Hecker, my chief of staff and Luke Tudball, who consistently work behind the scenes to make me look far more tech savvy than I am and are always on top of every issue. With that, I am honored to introduce Colonel Dan Toodle. Welcome and thank you so much for being here tonight.
There we are, we're unmuted. There we go. Uh, I'm Dan Tootle. I, I'm a resident in Severna Park, Maryland. Have been a resident here since 1986 um, after finishing uh, military service uh, with the U.S. Navy and then working locally here in defense contracting until 2013. Um, very busy in the community, uh, church and otherwise. And also, um, um, since retiring from work as a defense contractor here in the area, like many other of our fellow, of our veterans, uh, both men and women, who have uh, finished their military service and then decided to settle here in Maryland and in Anne Arundel County. Um, um, as, as I've grown older, I've grown older, I've found that there's many things to do. Uh, and, and one of those areas that I found uh, a, a lot of pleasure in, in, in working and, and helping is, uh, in fact, with our veterans community. Um, I had the pleasure and the honor of being part of the Anne Arundel County Veterans Affairs Commission uh, for some period of time. Um, I'm no longer in the commission, but I continue to work in advocating for, for veterans and, and, and our military families and our active duty military personnel who are here uh, in our area. I might just take a brief moment to really talk about uh, who are we talking about here? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, there's a good representation of veterans and active duty military right on, in this panel. Um, we have John Church, who's retired Air Force Reserve Colonel, who's the head of the Veterans Affairs Commission. You have uh, Gunny Jones, retired from the U.S. Marine Corps, and I'm with the U.S. Navy. And our Army uh, tonight is represented very ably by Don Gile, who is a military spouse and married to a very fine uh, Army fellow. So... Uh, all our services are, in fact, uh, represented here tonight. But um, in terms of what we're talking about, um, in particular, let me identify um, the folks who are here in Anne Arundel County as exemplars of, of the veterans um, that this particular townhouse is, is gathered uh, to uh, talk about. Here in Anne Arundel County, we have the second largest number of veterans resident in the state. Only Prince George's County has more veterans uh, in residence than Anne Arundel County. But Anne Arundel County is fairly unique in the state, not only with a very large number of veterans, numbering around 52,000 uh, veterans here in the state, but also the only county in the state that has three active military installations between the Fort Meade complex, uh, the US Naval Academy and its support uh, organization, and also the Coast Guard uh, Yard at Curtis Creek in the Brooklyn Park area. So uh, not only do we have the, uh, the 52,000 or so uh, military uh, uh, retirees, veterans, not all retirees, some have just been recently retired from active duty. Uh, the definition of a, of a veteran, according to the Department of Veterans Affairs, the US government, is that you must have served at least 18 months on active duty. So we're talking about young folks who have uh, been uh, involved with tours in uh, Afghanistan and other places around the world. who are young living here in the county and older people like myself who retired some time ago. Um, we're also talking about military families here in this, uh, in this county. We have around 10,000 active duty military here in Anne Arundel County. When you count in uh, their dependents, uh, their families, their children, um, my estimate is we have around probably over 80,000 people here in Anne Arundel County who uh, are either retired from the military or at the present time directly connected uh, to the military. And our students, Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Uh, here in the schools, we have uh, last count, was around 82,000 students in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. We have just under 9,000 military affiliated children going to our public schools. Over 11% of our public schools population are military affiliated kids. Uh, now, how do you tell someone is a veteran who's not a veteran? Well, you kind of have to look hard, uh, unless you see that, uh, uh, peculiar baseball cap with a military unit um, shown on the front, 
or maybe you saw a sticker on the back of their car that indicated they're a veteran or, or something in nature. But for the most part, they're your neighbors. We're, we're, we're the person next door. We're the person you go to church with. We're the person you see at the, uh, at the, at the school assemblies. Uh, that's who you see on the soccer field. That's who you see uh, watching the lacrosse games, uh, coaching um, in homeowners associations, uh, in businesses. Uh, we're just like everybody else, right? except we have that experience of having served on active duty uh, for our nation. So that's kind of a brief rundown of who we are. But like I say, uh, you kind of look hard to see who's a veteran and who's not. Now, having said all that, I really appreciate uh, Heather putting this town hall together to address uh, what is being done to support veterans and military families here in county and in the state of Maryland in general. Of course, Heather uh, represents in District 30, will be representing, has represented in District 33 and, and will be representing a District 33C after, after redistricting um, veterans on a wider level uh, and, and military families just in Anne Arundel County and in the Broadneck Peninsula area. Um, that's, a, that's a state obligation. And then we have Don, who is running as a, uh, as a state for the state Senate. Once again, she will have responsibility for, a, uh, uh, for generally Anne Arundel County, but the state as a whole. And in this last General Assembly, we had some very nice legislation go through assisting veterans. Um, I was able to, to work and help Heather uh, move the, um, the bill through the House for the establishment of a commission to look at establishing a Maryland Veterans Amendments Memorial here in the state of Maryland. We don't have one. We don't have one. We've got uh, around 33 memorials uh, here in the state of Maryland that are administered by the Maryland Department of Veterans Affairs, um, but none for women. <laughs> and uh, I tell you, we have a lot of ladies and women who have, who have served, who are serving, and um, have, who are veterans and otherwise. So a, a very large number in this state and uh, not having a memorial is just, is just not right. Um, good mental health uh, legislation has gone through, which applies to all of us and certainly will, will benefit the veterans and so on. We also has uh, tax bills as usual, but we also had a very interesting bill that was a joint bill put through um, called the, uh, uh, the uh, Purple Star School Program Initiative. It's like, what in the world is that? Well, <laughs> well uh, Maryland some time ago, a few years ago, like almost every state in the nation, signed up in what's called the Military Children's Education Coalition, the MCEC. And Maryland was a very early signer into that coalition for very obvious reasons. We've got a lot of military kids here. And, um, and, and, and military kids have stresses to deal with that other students simply do not have to deal with in their lives. And so uh, knowing the best way to support uh, in, in the school environment, uh, kids is always a good thing to have. But do this legislation that went through this year and goes into effect on July 1st. That's kind of like right around the corner, last time I saw. Um, um, now the state has stepped up to be a purple star, um, a, a purple star state, which means actively getting into military children education matters. Um, and uh, on July 1st, that legislation goes into effect and uh, we, we will be better prepared and able to support our military kids and the stresses they deal with. Uh, there's other things that we can be working on, uh, but um, I'm gonna you know, stop talking at this point and say, it's time for someone else to talk, talk about what they like to talk about. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful that you brought up the, the Purple Star Schools. I, I apologize, I think I said Purple Ribbon, not Star. Um, that, was, that was a bill that was so important to me because it actually was an issue that, that we talked about on our Veterans Town Hall uh, a year ago. Um, and then we had this bill that was, that was addressing that need, um, which was, uh, you know, as, as, as we talked about um, last year was, was uh, you know, it was, it was 
the needs of, of military families and particularly um, children of, of military families who, who may who may not be in the entire sort of um, continuum from you know first to, to 12th grade in the same location um, their their needs can be um, can be quite unique and so I was I was uh, very appreciative of, of that legislation. Um, I also wanted to take one moment to recognize um, Patrick Rubel, who is on this call. He is our legislative liaison. He is also a member of, of my home uh, legion, uh, Legion 7 in, uh, in Crown, uh, sorry, uh, Legion, <laughs> legion um, 175 in Severna Park. Five. <laughs> Park. Well, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of several legions. I have several in my district, so, um, but, but welcome, welcome to the call. Um, and, and, um, and Mr. Doodle gave us a great segue uh, to, to Don Guile, who is, um, who is running for Senate, but, but is also a military spouse. And so you have a, a much uh, more unique perspective uh, on, on uh, this, this world because um, when somebody is active duty military, it, 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 it impacts the entire family, correct? This is, you know, when, 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 when one person is serving, everyone is serving, um, which is not unlike uh, running for office. Um, but but I, I, I think, um, you know, so I think, I think your experience as a, as a military spouse um, makes you uniquely qualified for, um, for not just running for this office, but also um, making sure that, that, that we're meeting the needs of our, of our military families. Yes, thank you, Delegate Bagnell, um, for organizing us this evening on this very important topic and a topic that has been very near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, so my husband, uh, Sergeant Major DJ Guile, has been serving active duty in the Army for the last 24 years. We do have a retirement date of September 1st this year, counting down the days <laughs> a little bit. Um, and uh, it's... Um, one topic that has been a, a very important to me is uh, the topic of military spouse employment and um, supporting not only those that serve and have served, but also recognizing the important contributions of the family and recognizing, I think also that um, the readiness and recruitment and retention of good service members in our armed forces and necessitates also supporting the families, uh, including the military spouses and including the children. We hear often um, that service members leave service because it's just too hard on their families. Um, and that's one issue that I have personally worked on. Um, uh, Delegate Bagno mentioned that I'm an attorney. I've been a lawyer for the last uh, 15, 16 years, but an organization that I led is called Military Spouse JD Network, which is really specific, but it's an award-winning organization of over a thousand members. And one of the topics, or one of the, one of our focuses has been on military spouse employment and specifically how often uh, military spouses moving from state to state, um, if they have a certain licensure, and um, moving to that new state means they have to get relicensed and additional costs, additional red tape, additional headaches, and a lot of them just don't want to deal with it. Um, and uh, it's a recognition now that our um, military was originally set up with a different family structure in mind. They recognize now that there are many dual um, income households, that um, careers are important for military spouses as well. Um, and supporting military spouses uh, in the workforce um, is important to supporting our active duty service members um, as well. Um, another, uh, just as, as a brief a bio off me on that, uh, is in addition on, uh, uh, to our focus on military spouse employment, um, we also had a program called, or we also have a program called Justice for Military Families doing pro bono legal work for Gold Star families through a partnership with Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors or TAPS based out of Arlington, pro bono legal work for veteran caregivers um, through a partnership with the American Red Cross. Um, we recently received we're recipients of a large grant um, uh, to do pro bono legal work for veteran entrepreneurs. Um, I know me personally, as my husband faces his imminent transition out of the military, um, how important it is also to, uh, to support that transitioning service member to help find employment. Um, and um, 
Um, so that's a, th those are all topics that I have been focusing on through my nonprofit leadership. In addition to that, I also serve um, as secretary of an organization called um, Vigilant Torch Association and Foundation, and uh, we do emergency relief assistance and um, uh, scholarships for members of the special operations community and their families. One um, um, piece of legisl legislation that I was very excited about for being passed from this session and very much grateful for Delegate Bagnell's support and vote on um, this, this topic is paid family and medical leave. And I know this is something that benefits um, all Maryland families ultimately, but there um, it also supports military families in that um, it gives up to 12 weeks, not only if you have a baby or if you're recovering from illness or injury, but also if your service member is deployed. Um, I have to say that um, I, I hear often from military spouses, not only moving from state to state, these uh, barriers to employment of licensure, but also um, you find yourself at the very bottom of daycare waiting lists trying to find affordable quality childcare for your kids. You don't have family nearby. Um, you don't have um, uh, that kind of support system that a lot of other people may have. And um, paid family and medical leave really helps military families to, to deal with the very big stressors of um, deployment time period. I know myself personally, my, um, my, my husband uh, with our second child, he was gone for um, most of my pregnancy, came home just before the birth, and then left within, um, I think, three to four days after I gave birth. Uh, and it was very, very difficult on me. And I was fortunate. I had about, um, I had uh, some, some uh, paid family leave during that time period from my job, but um, with no family nearby, it was definitely a challenge for me to continue to work. Uh, so other... Um, um, it, 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 paid family and medical leave will have a profound impact, not only for, Mil for Maryland families as a whole, but I think especially also for recognizing the important contributions of military families and to support military families during that very challenging time of deployments. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I'll go ahead and, and pass the mic um, then. I'm not uh, sure if there's any other topics to, to discuss, but that was one that I wanted to, to highlight. Well, I really appreciate that. And, I, and I, I particularly appreciate you talking about the intersectionality of some of this legislation. I think sometimes we don't think of, of, of some of these bills as, as being through, you know, a, a military um, lens or, you know, a, a veteran lens. But, but you're right. So many of these, um, so many of, of our legislative efforts have a have a direct impact on on our, our veteran communities. And, and as, you know, as uh, Dan pointed out, we have a very large veteran population um, in, in just in Anne Arundel County um, because of our proximity to the Naval Academy, our proximity to Fort Meade, um, NSA. Uh, we, I believe, have have the largest in Maryland, or the second largest. Um, Dan, Dan, Dan will will correct me um, uh, on on that one. I'm sure, but. Um, and when we're when we're thinking about uh, the impact of of this legislation. We have to think not just about um, the the service members, but also about about their families. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, and I and I wanted to turn to to um, to Gunny Jones, who um, I got to know when I first uh, took office because we both shared a a, a passion for um, for broadening and expanding mental health services. And I know that um, that there has been a, an ongoing challenge in, um, in ensuring a continuity of care for, for our veterans um, to, you know, from, from, um, from the VA, which tends to be a federal program, we have state services, but then we have county services um, and, and it, it can be a huge challenge. We know that we are, are looking at um, a, a, a very high, uh, rate of suicide, 22 a day, um, and and unique challenges that that often um, even even uh, speaking to to uh, mental health uh, issues can can be a barrier in and of itself, um, which is why we have um, broadened our focus on on things like peer to peer services, where where we're we're connecting people with 
uh, with, with people who have similar experiences. Um, so, so Mr. Jones, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a great uh, admirer of your work and, um, and you hold me accountable. Yes, okay. When you start talking about suicide and veterans, the number they tell you is 22 a day, but in actuality, it's more than that because that's only what they tell you because that's what's being reported. If you look at how many, some states don't report overdoses as suicides. And so if a veteran overdose is not reported as a suicide, and if a veteran's in a car accident, and it's a single car accident, it's not reported as a suicide. So you have to look at the mindset of the person that's driving that car. Was that veteran drinking? Was he upset when he got in the vehicle? What was his mindset? So everything that you hear about 22 a day can't be, it's not always the fact. It may be more than 22 a day. So, and as far as getting to a mental health program, I think my camera just froze up. Can you hear me? I think your camera froze, but we can still hear you. Okay. Yes. So as far as getting into a mental health program, it's, we'll think it is, it basically, the first thing you have to do is talk to your primary care doctor and tell that doctor, when you, when you go to see your doctor, the doctor, first question the doctor asks you is, how are you doing today? And the normal thing people would tell their doctor is, doc, I'm doing fine. Well, my statement to that is that's the first lie you tell your doctor. I, I'm, I have no cut card. So when you walk in at the office, you have to tell the doctor, hey, doc, I, I'm having problems. Doc, you know, this is bothering me. So once you admit to the doctor there's a problem, then he can first help you. So if you tell the doc you're thinking about hurting yourself or you're having pressure at home or you're feeling depressed, that doctor will write a counsel for you to mental health to help you out. So that's your first place you go is to your, your primary care doctor. And part of that also falls in your family. If you have friends and family that know that you normally act a certain way and they see you act in a different way, they should approach you. You should approach that person, your friend, and tell them, hey, look, you know, you're normally this way. Why are you doing this? What's going on? Ask the hard question. Don't just gaff it off and say, oh, well, he's just having a bad day. No, it may be more than that. But there's help in the county. You have places like the Arundel Lodge. They have a place on um, at the hospital, at the Pat Sajak building. Uh, you drive to the rooftop, you get out, you park your car, get out, you go in the door on the right-hand side. There it is, the Arundel Lodge. They don't turn anyone away. And if you think a person is feeling suicidal, you take them to the ER. And he let them know, hey, um, I'm bringing this guy here or this person has told me, verbally stated to me that, hey, I'm going to kill myself. That's the steps you take. You must take action. Don't gaff it off. Don't, oh, he's just joking. You don't know. And so you take those steps. You give that person one more day of life. And as far as um, some of the other things I do is... When a veteran calls me and says, hey, uh, I just moved into the area and I don't have any place to live. What I end up doing is I, I'll take his name and number, sit down with him, and I'll point him, I'll do a warm handoff and give him to an organization, ICCS, and say, hey, look, you know, this guy, this is his name, his phone number. Here he is. He's looking for housing. He's looking for a job or whatever the case may be, but I don't just give him a phone and say, hey, call this number. No, we give him a warm handoff to make sure he knows who he's talking to, what, what they're talking about. And I tell him about the county. You know, hey, you can do this here, you can do that. And what, what, do, what, do you, what type of work do you want to do? What, what are you up for? You ask questions to the veteran. You, you talk to him. And like Heather says, you know, I've I've called their office. I left text messages and said, hey, you know, this, I see this is wrong. What are you going to do about it? And you can't be afraid to talk to your, your elected officials. 
And I tell people, they work for us. And I understand there's only one Heather, but there are a bunch of us. And we are your eyes and your ears in the community. We let you know what's going on. And we can't be afraid to do that. And the other thing about veterans here in this county is that, you know, we need a lot of help. We have a lot of senior veterans in, in their county that are going, they're lacking. They can't move around in their own homes. And so there are things out there we can help them with. We can help them get ramps to their houses. We can help them get chairs that can go up and down, gliders, things like that. But we have to know that they need these things. And as you say, as a veterans, um, children's in school, the Blue Star family also is here in Anne Arundel County. They will help military children, and they also want to help veterans. But the thing about veteran dependents of veterans who have already left the veterans' home and their children's, when they're in school, they have the same issues that the military child has, except their little issues are a little bit different. And I'll pick on myself. I did 21 years in the Marine Corps. I deal with traumatic brain injury, PTSD. So my children dealt with a person who had traumatic brain injury and PTSD. Drastic moves. I think I think we may have lost Mr. Jones. So hopefully he'll he'll come back in. Um, well, while we're waiting for uh, for him to join us, I did want to acknowledge um, Karen Meyer, who's joined the call. Um, he is a candidate for County Council District Five. He's also the recipient of the Small Business Association's uh, Small Veteran Owned Business of the Year. Um, so you know, I think I think. Uh, and he's and he's a candidate for District Five, right? Um, but I, I think I think it speaks to the fact that we also have um, veterans uh, serving and running at every level of of office, which isn't really surprising since um, you know since they have a, a a career of public service. You know, we have Mike Rogers, my colleague and the chair of the um, the Anne Arundel County delegation who was not able to join us tonight, but has been um, a staunch advocate. And, and, uh, um, and to, to Mr. Jones's point, also uh, a great colleague in, in helping um, those of us who, who haven't served in, and haven't been in military families um, have a, a greater understanding of the need and also um, the, the impact of, of, of legislation. Um, as we're talking about uh, mental health um, and we have a greater understanding each, every day. We have a greater understanding of of, of the needs for for mental health uh, resources and also um, the challenges in, in broadening those resources. There were a couple of bills um, that that were very meaningful uh, to me, and I just wanted to mention them. One was one was actually um, I believe last session, and then one was this session, um, and one dealt with. Um, it, ensuring that veterans were eligible for um, for health services regardless of the discharge statute uh, status because um, because uh, mental health care uh, is an essential and and sometimes mental illness is is the reason for um, for a, a discharge and so uh, the Maryland General Assembly worked on a bill to ensure that veterans would have access to, um, to those resources, uh, which was, was really important to a lot of us who have, who have family and friends who have suffered mental illness, who also have served. Um, and this year um, we passed a bill and, and I, as, as we're still in the month of June, which is Pride Month, I think it's, it's worth, uh, worth mentioning, which was the Restoration of Honor Act. And this addressed um, LGBTQ, service members who, um, who were, uh, were not honorably discharged because, um, because it, they, they, their discharge preceded um, the, um, you know, pre pre preceded uh, uh, the, the uh, change in military status that allowed for LGBTQ members. Um, and so I, I think 
it's important to recognize that um, as, as, as we talked about the variety of, of veterans and veteran families and uh, that, that um, we, are, um, we are broadening our understanding and also broadening our legislation to make sure that we're providing resources for the broad range of, of people that want to serve. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to put those on the radar as, as, as legislation that I think was very meaningful for a lot of, of, um, a lot of our community to recognize that, that, that we have service members and people who want to serve, um, who, who are, are you know, from a broad range of backgrounds and a broad range of ideologies. And, um, and we're, we're, we're always uh, looking for how we can improve um, in that arena. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna get Mr. Jones back and I, I apologize, um, but he's, I, I do wanna say that, that he has been a, a huge advocate and has really worked to uh, broaden the services in this county and also to, to um, as he said, to uh, inform legislators and, and hold us accountable to ensure that, that we are, um, that we are uh, serving our, our members to the best of our ability. Um, and, and I did talk a little bit about uh, the American legions and I wanna turn to, to that because I know that we have several legions that are represented on this call. In fact, um, Mr., Mr. Jones um, works with American Legion 141 in Annapolis. Um, I know we've got representatives from 175 in Severna Park, from Crownsville in, uh, uh, from uh, American Legion 7 in Crownsville. Um, I've done work with uh, American Legion 267 in um, Severn. And, uh, and, and uh, some of the work that, that began, that's, that's now at Arundel Lodge, actually began out of the American Legion in Annapolis and, and uh, um, several resource fairs have also been conducted out of, out of that Legion. So I, I wanted to pose the question, like how, um, as, as we're looking at, at how we can help our legions as well, because we um, often, oh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just, was just made aware that, that, that Gunny is back with us. Um, so, Mr. Jones, we were just talking about um, about the uh, the work of the American Legions and how um, American Legions are are working to help serve our service members. Okay, because I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You know, but technology isn't always our friend. <laughs> well, at the American Legion, we help veterans in many ways, from helping them secure electric bills that they may run short of one month to helping them with any utility bill or helping them with food or getting a ride to a doctor's appointment. And we do many things. So we're there for any vet and also for the veterans family. We also help them fill out their paperwork for benefits and also help them fill out paperwork for the, the veterans dependent of a deceased veteran. The spouse may have, may rate benefits that she doesn't know about. We help them do that paperwork also. There have been many um, spouses that have come in and asked questions, and they were actually in nursing homes. And we help them get that paperwork taken care of to help pay for the nursing home care. So there's a lot of things that the American Legion, the VFWs, the DAV, and all those other organizations, Fleet Reserve, that they do to help veterans and their families in the county and the city. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and welcome back. Thank you, thank you for your, your um, uh, dil diligence in, in, uh, in returning with us. And um, recently I was able to attend a couple of, of the, um, the flag retiring ceremonies as well, which the, which the American legions were conducting, um, retiring the, the flags that, that, were, um, that were no longer viable for service, but, um, but they, they conducted ceremonies so to respectfully retire um, the American flags. Um, and I know that they also conduct uh, services. Oh, I'm, I'm being gestured at to, to 
turn it over to Mr. Tudball. Okie dokie. All right, hold, hold on one second, guys. I'm just figuring out the, uh, there we go. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, so um, we did have a couple of email questions, um, and I don't want to put Mr. Roberts on the spot. I know he's he's here with us. Um, but uh, a couple of uh, people have been asking us about how, uh, if, if the, uh, what services, uh, for example, would the Maryland Chamber of Commerce for Veterans Chamber of Commerce be able to help with as far as veterans businesses um and uh so i said if mr roberts is able to speak for a moment uh, perfect i'm going to go ahead and, and spotlight him just for a second here and uh, welcome first of all, mr. thank roberts. you guys for allowing me to join you here and i do apologize for my earlier connectivity uh like mr jones my had a power surge and my computer went out so i had to wait for it to boot back up to come back in um, the Maryland Veteran Chamber of Commerce uh, we, was founded in 2018, and the objective of the Chamber of Commerce, not to give you guys a long story about it, but veteran-owned businesses don't have the opportunity in many cases to be successful, to generate revenue. We find that a lot of people have training programs for 30, 60, 90 days. But what happens to the veteran-owned business after that 90 days? Oftentimes, you know, Veteran-owned businesses don't get the opportunity to go out to government contracts or commercial contracts or get the training to understand how to respond to an RFP or how to particularly go after commercial opportunities. So what I created was an organization that's designed to create a 24-month training program for new veteran-owned businesses. But the biggest part of everything is to bring veteran-owned businesses together so that we can help to form positive team and agreements where we support one another to go after business opportunities to create revenue, to bring revenue to the state of Maryland. My goal by 2032, we're talking 10 years from now, is to have enough federal businesses associated with the Maryland Veterans Chamber of Commerce to generate $10 billion in revenue into this state. That helps veteran businesses, it helps their families, it helps to build veteran relationships, and it creates a decent taxation for the state of Maryland to help finance other opportunities for the general population as well. And so my focus is really on trying to help veterans come together to build business opportunities, to get the proper training necessary so they can have successful opportunities. We all know that new businesses generally fail 50% when they come out. So if we can train them and give them 24 months to come in to understand how to go about business, to do CEO to CEO training, to build team and agreements, to teach them how to read RFPs, to teach them how to write proposals, to teach them how to market their company, brand their company, how to define their services, how to do a capability statement, everything they need to understand, then we're gonna give them a greater opportunity to be successful. The other key component is imagine if, a veteran-owned businesses come together and we subcontract to one another. That gives that veteran an opportunity to get past performance, again, to create an opportunity for him to individually or her individually to go at the business opportunities. So there are several things that I can tell you guys, but that's the, the, the fundamental basic of what the Maryland Veteran Chamber of Commerce is all about. We're a 501c3 organization. We're getting ready to add the 501c6 organization. The objective behind the 501c6 is so we can have a, a lobbyist to go after legislation to ensure we write the right legislation you know, for uh, veteran-owned businesses in the state of Maryland. I spoke to the Lieutenant Governor for Indiana uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference where she attended, and she was letting me know that veterans pension is not taxed in that particular state. But here in Maryland, we're having a problem advancing that opportunity to help veterans who have retired, who have pension, to not be taxed. We're talking less than 2% of the population who defends this country, put their lives on the line, make super sacrifices, but are the least of the entire population who gets taken care of for our sacrifices. We're not begging, we're bringing brilliance and knowledge and discipline to whatever we come to. We're bringing hard work, ethics to everything we come to. All we're asking for is legislation to support us so we can do one thing. I live life for one purpose and that's to win. That's all I have for now. 
Well, thank you so much. That was a lot. Um, uh, Mr. Roberts, do you have uh, contact information that we could put in the chat and, and, um, and, and send a, send a follow-up as well sure. um, to, you know, to, to our folks to make sure that they know how to get in contact with the, um, with the, the, uh, Veterans Chamber of Commerce. And thank you so much for being here and for, um, you know, for, for being part of this conversation. Um, this is, this is how we, this is how we make change. This is how we, we, we get these ideas on the table. Um, and so I, I appreciate you taking advantage of, of, of getting that, that effort in front of us. Um, so I, I am cognizant of the time. Um, was there another, um, oh, um, and, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Mr. Todd Bull again. So, hey, um, speaking of business, thank you so much, Mr. Roberts. We do actually have, as uh, Delegate Bagnall had mentioned, uh, the winner of the um, Small Business Association Maryland Owned Veteran Business of the Year. Uh, that's uh, Carl Niemeyer. And I, I saw him... Uh, uh, putting his hand up there in the chat. So again, without putting you on the spot, Carl, uh, did you uh, did you want to make any comments here? I, I was applauding everything he was saying. Um, apologize for no face and many other noises because I'm cooking, getting dinner ready for five kids. But um, <laughs> yes, and it is a very, very difficult thing in Maryland where I've got a number of veterans that work for me that, you know, that when they retire, they don't want to stay here in Maryland. And it's a terrible situation to have them have served 20 plus years and not want to stay in the state that they maybe even grew up in unless they retired as an E9 or an 06 or an 07. Uh, so yeah, that is one of the things that I wish would have happened a long time ago. And I really hope we can keep making progress towards. And on your point about the Veterans Chamber of Commerce, I remember it pre-pandemic going to one meeting and I'd love to see a lot more come out of that because there are a lot of good veteran businesses out there and a lot of not so good ones out there as well. And the good ones really need to be put on the spot so we can all work together and subcontract to each other. Cause that's, I am I'm a mechanical contractor and there is so much opportunity out there for us to work together and provide more opportunities for veterans, whether it's just in management or in labor and getting people, not only just good jobs, but getting homeless veterans off the street and into good paying jobs. Well, thanks very much, Cole, for, uh, for, joining us this evening and of course for stepping up to uh to to run to represent our community uh, that's uh it's always a huge thing uh, taking that on board especially when you have you know a family to bring up um, and a business to run and and all of those other sorts of things um i did uh just want to reach out real quick and see if any of the other uh audience here had any other questions Hi, this is John Church. I don't have questions, but I have a couple of quick comments. Sure, I've been no, following, I I've Yes, been sir. Following, following the discussion closely. And when this is over, what I would like to do is submit to Delegate Bagnell some um, names and addresses of organizations that specialize in measuring um, veterans' performance, various issues that affect variant veterans' um, when they retire, as they re transition from active to service to retirement, that I think will be helpful um, and maybe an important resource for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I saw that uh, Mr. Gibao had his hand raised. So I'm gonna go ahead and add him right now. Uh, thank you and Delegate Bagnall. It's always a pleasure to, to be in your company. Uh, I wanna commend Mr. Roberts he gave one of the most poignant points, and I've been on this issue about tax reform for uh, since I've been working with the legislature, and that's over four years. And all I heard was we're going to create jobs, cause more jobs in the tech community, and we need to hear from small businesses and the points that, the, that are being made. And I think that Emmett Roberts really nailed the thing. And if I'd have had him on my team four years ago, we'd have had this bill. But I also want to say that as in the coming year, as I've already spoke to Delegate Bagnall about, 
we need to really be concentrating on veteran suicide. And as uh, Curtis Jones said, and he's a close friend of mine, yes, there are more than 22 suicides a day because yes, we have situations where people have died by car, died by cop, things like this. And we need to, we, we need an omnibus bill that takes in mental health, employment opportunities, and personal growth. And uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, Heather. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to attend. Thank you so much, Mr. Hubao. And um, and I remember very early in in, in the you know uh, in Delegate Bagnell's office, uh, a form and, and uh, the the crisis response team was there. And uh, the delegate had asked, you know, a question, which was, well, you know, we're we're aware that you know you guys are sort of taking care of us, but who's taking care of you? And I think it's really important that you know we had we we try to figure out services and ways of taking care of the carers. And uh, yeah. I know that Delegate Bagnell would like to speak to that, so I'm going to pass back to her. I just, I just want to say thank you because you know this is this is an issue that is is so important and so close to my my heart, and and I do feel like we have, you know, we have the right voices, we have the right resources. I welcome any um, any additional information and education because that you know this is. Um, Mental, mental health is not out of my wheelhouse, um, but you know, ensuring that we're providing the right services uh, for, the, for, the, for the audience uh, that needs it is, is really important that we have the, you know, the, the right voices at the table. So, um, uh, and I, I, I am aware of the time, so I wanna make sure that I give all of my panel, first of all, a huge thank you. Thank you to everyone uh, for speaking tonight, for speaking to um, our legislative successes, our legislative um, deficits, uh, what we still need to do, how far we still need to go. Um, and also thank you for everyone who was on this call tonight. Uh, Mr. Roberts, I look forward to, um, to working together and, and figuring out how to, to really make uh, the Veterans Chamber of Commerce a, a significant voice with the, the Maryland legislature, because I, I, I think, um, you know, to, to Dan Toodle's point, you are uh, uniquely positioned for, for really um, uh, ensuring that, we're, that we are creating that legislation that does support our veterans and does support, uh, you know, uh, our veteran-owned businesses, and and that we're not uh, creating legislation that is missing the mark. So thank you so much for being here. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to to Mr. Jones for for any final comments, and then we'll go to um, to Don Guile and then to Dan Tootle, and then uh, we will um, end the evening. So so Mr. Jones, thank you so much for being here. No, thanks a lot for having me and the rest of the rest of the team here. It's uh, very important that you know we think about mental health on a daily basis. And there are, like I said, a lot of vets out there hurting, and a lot of us that don't know how to ask for help. And you know that's just a, a big step right there is asking for help. And one thing that the along the lodge would like to do is they would like to offer more help to veterans, but a lot of vets don't know that the Rundalaj even exists. So far from talking to the Rundalaj, they've only served like 91 veterans and they will utilize the, um, they will utilize the, the VA payment situation. And also they will also take TRICARE and they will serve active duty personnel. So they don't turn anyone away. And that's all I have to say right now. And thank, thank you. you. And, and we'll make sure that we get the, um, the contact information for Rundle Lodge out, out as well. Um, and we'll put that, that, um, that information on our website. Uh, but it sounds like we need to, to look at some resources for, for an educational arm to make sure that this information is getting to the people who need it the most. So, um, so 
Mr. Church, I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you. Mr. Grabo, I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you as well. Um, uh, Don Guile, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, you know, to, 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 to finish, you know, close the loop and make the ask. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you so much again, Delegate Bagnell for organizing this uh, this evening. Um, I do think that we have an obligation to uh, support those who have um, served our country and put their, um, you know, their, their lives on the line for us. And uh, we've talked about the host of issues that veterans and military families face from suicide to um, employment issues to, you know, concerns of supporting military um, spouses and military children. And, um, you know, I thank you for your continued advocacy on that and um, look forward to serving with you later in the General Assembly. <laughs> um, and uh, again, um, I'm Don Guile. I'm running for Senate in District 33. Would appreciate your support. Um, but, um, but thank you again for the opportunity for this discussion. Absolutely. And thank you for, for bringing your perspective, because um, I think it's such an important piece of, of that puzzle as, as we're looking at, at, at veteran services. Mr. Tootle, um, we, have, we have worked long and hard on legislation together, and, and so I wanted to give you the opportunity to have the last word on, on this one. I think the, the thing that uh, we need to be worked, uh, in addition to these, these specific issues, there's a more general issue that we really need to be paying attention to, and it's, it goes right to state legislation, either as a delegate or as a member of the Senate. And that's, we are losing too many people who are retiring in this county who leave the state of Maryland because uh, they either cannot afford to live here, it's very expensive to live here, or the other surrounding states simply, give, uh, simply provide a better deal as a retiree uh, rather than living here. You know, there's 33,000 cars a day that go in and out of the Fort Meade complex. And if you've been on Highway 50 or I-97 in the morning or the afternoon, you know it. Okay. We need to have a lot of people who are now currently driving to Delaware not driving to Delaware. Come on. Um, so if there's legislation that uh, it goes to the point of making this, this state in this county, a much more attractive place to live. We need to be working on those issues. Thank you so, you so much, much, Mr. Tootle. Um, and all our speakers, uh, we, we are drawing very close to the end of this virtual town hall. Um, and, and I can speak from a personal place to say thank you to all of our guests. It really has been uh, an affordable evening and I, I really appreciate you all taking your time to be here with us tonight. And of course, I would like to thank our fabulous host, Delegate back now and for all of uh, the work that you all do. Um, and uh, of course, our surprise speakers, uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Church, thank you for joining us as well. And also uh, Carl Niemeyer. Uh, we are, of course, in a series of virtual town halls and a shameless little plug here right at the end. We do have another one next Wednesday evening. Uh, it is also about healthcare, specifically about women's reproductive healthcare. And for that one, we are, um, uh, uh, happy and proud to, to welcome Delegate Ariana Kelly to speak with us. Uh, Heather Miser, who uh, you may know is running for uh, the United States Congress in um, District 1, and also uh, Robin Elliott uh, from Planned Parenthood of Maryland. Uh, so please do join us for that. And in the meantime, I will leave the closing comments to our host. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again. Um, it's, it's really important uh, when we're looking at legislation that we're hearing from the voices of the people who are going to be most impacted. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, we, we, can, we can end up with legislative blinders, but also when we have these opportunities of, of sitting down and talking through these issues, talking through the successes, talking through the need, um, that's where we come up with some, some good ideas and some good connections. So I just want to thank everyone who uh, joined us tonight and, um, and reaffirm my commitment to resolving these issues and making sure that we are really, um, we are meeting the, and succeeding the needs of our veterans and that, that we, are, we are making Maryland a state that is very welcoming and, um, and accommodating for our veteran communities, our veteran families and, um, and a great place to, to, uh, to serve and retire 
and, um, and, and raise your family. So thank you everyone for, for being part of that effort. And I look forward to, I look forward to uh, reconnecting with Arundel Lodge and getting to work on, on these issues. So thank you. Thank you.